Sometimes even one phone call can seriously change the entire history of mankind. September 1970, an article appeared in Esquire magazine that dramatically changed the life of a student from San Jose. The secrets of the little blue box described how talented attackers deceived phone networks with the help of a children's toy. The sound of a boatswain's pipe from a Captain Crunch lunchbox was precisely a match to the signal of an automatic switchboard. One simply had to whistle in the phone at the right time to make a free long distance call. In just a few weeks, a young guy hiding behind the pseudonym Berkeley Blue created a digital device that mimicked these signals. Together with a friend, he set up a garage production. The components only cost about $40, so he was clearing a tidy profit offering 150 bucks for the finished product. In a couple of months, the two Steves, yes, him and his friend had the same name, earned more than $6,000. They planned to use the money to build their own computer, but these plans were not destined to become a reality. Their plans were foiled by their own strange sense of humor. One day, with the help of their invention, they called the Vatican. One of the Steves introduced himself as Henry Kissinger, the, at the time, United States Secretary of State, and then asked to be connected with the Pope, despite the fact that it was five in the morning, Italian time. The secretary woke up Paul V. Obviously, he was furious about the silly prank and ordered that the perpetrators should be punished. It took the police just a couple of months to find the unlucky pranksters, and they turned out to be some young student named Steve Wozniak and his friend Steve Jobs. The AT&T phone company joined the lawsuit. Wozniak and Jobs were both found guilty of fraud and sent to prison for five years. They served the entire term and were released only in 1976. The trial broke up the duo and they never worked again. G'day everyone, my name is Lucas and today I will tell you about a world without Apple. Okay, so that story isn't entirely true, but it could have been. In November 1970, Jobs and Wozniak did actually call the Pope uh, with their invention, but the pontiff's secretary, thankfully, wasn't so gullible and decided not to wake up Paul V. Let's return to the history of technological developments. Apple is often considered to be the creator of the first mass personal computer, the Apple II. This is not actually true though. The first personal computer appeared on the market in 1975, and it was created by Henry Roberts and based on the latest Intel 8080 processor. The Altair 8800 was sold either pre-assembled for $621 or as a self-assembled kit at $439. Over the next three years, Roberts managed to sell 25,000 computers. He couldn't have believed his success. Roberts only expected to sell about 100 computers a month. Now, the success of Altair helped another person start their business. It was on this computer that Bill Gates wrote his first commercially successful product, an interpreter for basic programming language. It took him just 30 days to put it together, and in order to make a deal, Gates created a company that he named Microsoft. We'll come back to Gates a little bit later. The architecture of the Altair 8800 became a source of inspiration for Steve Wozniak. So in 1975, the Apple I appeared. And to be fair, compared to Robert's computer, it looked extremely unassuming basically just a wooden box with some dials. It was built around the cheapest microprocessor on the market, the MOS 6502. Comparable processors from Intel and Motorola cost upwards of 200 bucks, and the 6502 just sold for $25. This made it possible to build a computer for $500. Jobs and Wozniak managed to interest only one person in their development, the owner of a computer store, Paul Terrell. There were huge wait lists for the Altair, the company couldn't satisfy everyone who wanted to buy a computer, so Paul decided to take a chance and he ordered a batch of 50 Apple computers. In total, about 200 Apple computers were released, but Jobs and Wozniak invested all of the returns in the development of the improved Apple II model. Many people call the Apple II the first truly popular personal computer. Of course, more than 6 million of which were sold, and this definitely exceeds Altair's 25,000. That's pretty good. But it was in 1979 that the company succeeded by releasing a program that really turned the world around. I'm talking about VizCalc spreadsheets. The idea of this program came to a man called Daniel Bricklin during a lecture on economics. Here's that classroom. They put up a plaque to commemorate what happened there. Back then, complex tables with financial calculations had to be completely rewritten if at least one parameter changed. The lecturer did it on a blackboard, 
with a piece of chalk, erasing the old numbers and writing down new ones, and the students had to rewrite everything over and over again. So naturally, Daniel imagined that if you could transfer the board to the computer, you would be able to automate a huge number of calculations. It only took Bricklin a week to develop the first version of the program. But even in this version, we can already see the features of spreadsheets that are pretty familiar to all of us today. Bricklin created VizCalc on his home computer, which happened to be the Apple II. The application sparked a real revolution. The Apple II was transformed from an entertainment device to a business tool. A simple and intuitive interface allowed financiers, accountants, with no understanding of programming, to use the computer. In just six years, they managed to sell 700,000 copies of this program. Moreover, it could only be run on an expensive Apple II model with its whopping 32 kilobytes of RAM. The demand for it grew so much that many dealers sold the computers with VizCalc already pre-installed. During the year, Apple became the leader of the personal computer market. This success even prompted IBM managers to develop personal computers for business. And this is how the chess project appeared, which later then turned into IBM PC computers. I would hazard a guess that without VizCalc and Apple, the introduction of computers into offices would have appeared much later. Large American companies in the early 80s would have continued to work using the old fashioned way, calculators, pencils, and this would have affected the entire economy. Without new information technologies, companies would have been looking for a way out of the 1982 economic crisis for a lot longer. Most likely the success of Reaganomics would have been in question, which means that in 1984, Walter Mondale could have become the 41st president of the United States. And this would have changed the country's foreign policy. The Cold War with the Soviet Union could have gone on for at least until the mid 90s. The Iron Curtain would still divide Berlin into its Western and communist parts, and the military campaigns in Libya would have never begun. Back to computers. The success of VizCal confirmed Jobs' belief that computers were needed not only for engineers and programmers. The trouble was that computers were very difficult to use for everybody else. Most of the work was done via command line. Users had to memorize dozens of commands for each program. Therefore, in 1979, the Apple team started developing a fundamentally new type of interface, graphical interfaces. Once again, we're faced with a misconception. Apple, in fact, was not the first company to address this issue. The first graphical interface was created by Xerox engineers. In March 1973, two years before the first Apple computer appeared, they released the first 30 Alto computers. A desktop appeared on the screens for the first time, and a computer mouse was used to work with programs in addition to the keyboard. Over 10 years later, Xerox released a little more than 2,000 of these computers. Yet, maybe unfortunately for them, they were mainly used internally in their offices of the company itself. The graphical interface of the Apple Lisa computer, which was presented to the public in 1983, largely repeated the developments of Xerox. And this isn't surprising. Jobs not only saw the Alto, but he also managed to lure a group of engineers involved in its development to his company. An echo of this story will later be the skirmish of the fight between Jobs and Gates in 1985, when Microsoft, introducing its graphical operating system Windows 1, is accused by Jobs of plagiarism. In response to that, he replies, well, it was you who borrowed these ideas from Xerox. Therefore, in a world without Apple, the familiar graphical interfaces of computers would undoubtedly have appeared eventually in the market. But a couple years later, the art of memory of IBAM and PC computers would not allow them at the time to be released earlier. Oh, and Gates would have made a bit more money, I think. More noticeable changes would also affect the publishing business. In our world, in 1985, Apple released a revolutionary application for its Macintosh computer, the desktop publishing system, PageMaker. Newspapers, magazines, and books began to be designed not by manually organizing templates and blocks of text in a printing house, but with the help of computers directly in the editorial office. The author of PageMaker was a man named Paul Brenard. Until 1983, he worked as a developer for ATEX, but then Kodak bought the company and Paul's department was closed. At the beginning of 1984, fortuitously, he had a meeting with Jobs. Bernard shared his idea of an electronic publishing system with Jobs who showed off his new desktop environment. The development of the first version took more than a year and the PageMaker version for other platforms appeared only in July 1987. By that time, Macintosh had already firmly established itself in all major publishing houses. Apple sales for the first time significantly overtook Atari and Amiga. Without Jobs' support, PageMaker would have forever remained just a beautiful idea in Brainard's head. 
Of course, the guys from Adobe or Xerox would eventually come to this sort of idea one way or another, but it wouldn't have appeared before the mid 1990s. And then other editors such as Illustrator or Photoshop would have then appeared even a few years later. Most likely the delay in the introduction of new technologies would have greatly undermined the publishers and newspapers of magazines. At the end of the 80s, they were already losing the battle for eyeballs to informational TV channels, and a sharp reduction in product cost was the only way for them to stay afloat. It turns out that in a world without Apple, we would have had to say goodbye to the morning paper much earlier. So we can safely skip over the next 12 years or so. In 1985, of course, Jobs was fired from his own company. I'm not gonna go into the details, but I will note that over those years, Apple did not release a single breakthrough product to the market. At the beginning of the 2000s, the company was on the verge of death. Apple losses for the year 2000 amounted to 25 million. The turnover fell by a third in just a year. Only a miracle could save the company. And it happened. October 23rd, 2001, Steve Jobs presented the iPod. There it is, right there. It's hard to appreciate how crazy this seemed back then. A once outstanding computer manufacturer hoped to improve its position with the help of an MP3 player. Are you serious? The iPod was not the first MP3 player. It wasn't distinguished by any advanced technical solutions. And besides, it was only compatible with Apple computers. In the first months of sales, about 150,000 devices were sold. But this was only the first step towards conquering the music market. Before the advent of the iPod, listeners either had to download tracks from the internet or convert them from purchased CDs. Music piracy was breaking all records. Record companies naturally were coming up with more and more ways to deal with it, but file sharing networks were winning, naturally. Jobs suggested a way out, the iTunes Store. In its own platform, in which users could download individual songs by popular artists for just 99 cents. Do you remember the advertising slogan of the first iPod? A thousand songs in your pocket. So in order to fill it out legally, the user would have to spend exactly $990. Not bad, right? In fact, there wasn't much left for the company at first. For example, under an agreement with Universal, Apple had to pay 70 cents for every dollar. But on the other hand, the company did receive 30 cents for each song without even having to buy it themselves. At the same time, Jobs said that users were tired of the tyranny of labels. They didn't need template commercial compilations on CDs. Listeners should be able to make their own selection of music without it being tied to physical media. The iPod and iTunes store combo just exploded onto the market. In the year after the launch of the digital store, users downloaded 70 million songs. The iPod became as much of a sought after item as the Sony Walkman had been 20 years previous. In the first three years, they sold less than 2 million players. Two years later, that number increased to 10 million. And by the mid of 2006, there were already 58 million iPods purchased. In fact, half of Apple's revenue back then was in the sale of digital music. In a world without Apple, we would still have to buy whole albums to listen to just two or three really worthwhile songs. Well, most likely, we wouldn't even buy them. We'd download them from some Napster 3.0 and still be fiddling with individual files and Trojans executing on our laptops. Sony would become a monopoly in the legal music market. They could repeat the success of 20 years earlier with their own Sony Music Library. Other manufacturers would target their MP3 players towards consumers of pirated content. Eventually, they would quickly bring their main attention to the smartphone market, and things would totally look different. Remember the popular mobile phones before 2007? A bunch of buttons, some with touchscreens, others with joysticks, wheels, sliders. What? Finnish engineers especially like to experiment a lot with the design. Different Nokia models resembled game consoles, lipstick cases. They unfolded, they slid, they flipped up. Every year, a new form appeared. But in 2007, the market changed dramatically and the era of the glass brick began. The new benchmark for style was set by one phone, the iPhone. And the history of the iPod was once again repeated. The unusual device was discussed everywhere, but most analysts agreed it was just an expensive toy and it wouldn't last on the market beyond a couple of years. Well, yes, the smartphone's large screen was admired, but almost everything else was criticized. The input method in particular took the most criticism. Poking your finger at the screen is just inconvenient. Without a stylus, you can't get to all those small buttons. You can't write a note by hand. You can't make a drawing. 
Even those few phone models that were created with an eye on the touchscreen interface were still equipped with a small pen for you to constantly lose and just rediscover behind the back of your sofa. Well, Jobs remembered why he had started reorganizing the company after his return. I'm talking about the closure of the failed PDA Newton project. A considerable part of the blame for the failure of the project was the issue of bad screens and malfunctioning styluses. In the new device, Jobs completely changed his approach. He cut all redundant features, a collection of buttons, a pen, a bunch of interfaces, and the ability to use MMS. Only the most basic features remained. The harshest critics compared the first generation of the iPhone to, well, some sort of budget over the store phone. But once you've held an Apple smartphone in your hands, it's impossible to put it down. Smooth animations, clear reaction to every touch, really left the impression of a smartphone from the future. There was no need for a stylus because there were no small icons or elements to touch. It was the first truly made from scratch phone. The PDA's legacy weighed heavily on everyone else. And yet, unlike the flagship Nokia, Sony, or Samsung, an Apple smartphone could be bought at a very affordable price. With a contract, it could be bought for just $4.99. Well, you know as well as I do what it led to in the future. The iPhone pretty much went on to dominate the direction of smartphone development for two decades. In a world without Apple, we would still be walking around with phones that were distinguishable just by looking at them without the manufacturer's logo. I think styluses would have become a relic, but proportions of the screens, the shape of the cases would differ much more. Nokia would have remained the market leader and would not have had to make a deal with Microsoft. Gradually, Finnish engineers would refine the promising MeeGo and maybe it would become the main competitor to the Android phones. Plus, we wouldn't be held hostage by the vertical videos, the trend that did come along with the advent of iPhones. The mobile gaming industry would change. Developers would have had to create dozens and dozens of different versions on platforms. So over time, some kind of universal technology might arise. There'd also be exclusive games and applications, and they would be widely used in advertising for new phone releases. Just like what happened with game consoles. The only thing I don't know is who those guys from Samsung would have copied smartphone designs from. So, Let's summarize the results of my extended thought experiments. The most noticeable difference in a world without Apple occurred in both politics and the entertainment industry. Walter Mondale in the presidential chair could have well closed the way for H.W. Bush to be in power. But gradually, the political situation would have ended up pretty similar to the present. The Soviet Union would have collapsed. The European Union would have begun. A few years don't make an especially big difference. We would have experienced the dot-com crisis in the same way in the beginning of the Web 2.0 era. Rampant digital privacy would have contributed to maybe more active development of peer-to-peer -peer networks and decentralized systems in general. You know, I think perhaps even cryptocurrencies could have appeared a few years earlier, but YouTube, streaming services, all of these would have developed significantly slower. Smartphones would not have gained widespread popularity so quickly without the iPhone. The era of mobile video would have begun a few years later. On the other hand, the guys from Netflix would have spent longer mailing DVDs to our mailboxes. Contrary to popular belief, Apple has created practically no new technologies. Steve Jobs' main talent was that he was able to combine existing solutions into amazing things. It was the combination of hardware and software that is to thank for the magic of Apple. Magic without which our world might have been a little worse off. Do you agree with this or not? Let me know what you think would have happened without the mighty Apple. I'd love to read about what other changes might have occurred. Well, this is Lucas, I'm sitting in sand, and I will see you soon in the weird and wonderful world of the online jungle.